All right, I still see we have some people rolling in, but I'm gonna go ahead and kick us off so we can make the, the most of our hour together. So welcome everyone to today's conversation, Build a Recruiting Machine. Uh, my name is Natalie Morgan. I'm the Senior Director of People at CareerPlug, and I'm gonna be facilitating the conversation today. Uh, before we kind of meet the stars of the show, a couple logistics for folks. Um, we are recording this webinar, so we're gonna send a copy of the recording to y'all tomorrow, as well as all, any other resources that we mentioned and to everyone who registered. Uh, and then please feel free to use the chat and Q&A throughout. We're going to try to take uh, some time for questions in the back half of the hour. So Q&A is a great place for questions. Uh, you can also use the chat to share your own ideas. It's a great place to learn from one another on these topics, right? And really be in community and conversation together here. Lauren on our team is also keeping an eye on your questions on the back end and helping us facilitate. So without further delay, I'm so pleased to introduce Clint Smith and Forrest Higdon. Uh, Forrest is the owner of Gumby's Pizza in San Marcos, which he just told me a few minutes before we started this webinar, was voted the best restaurant in San Marcos this week. So congratulations. And Clint Smith is the founder and CEO of Career Flag and also the author of the book, How to Hire, The Essential Guide to Recruit and Retain the Right People, which released last month um, and really inspired this conversation today. We're actually going to give you all a free ebook copy of um, how to hire at the end. I'll share the QR code and also share out that resource so you all have access to that. So to uh, really start off here, I'm going to share my uh, stop sharing my screen so we can all just look at each other. But Forrest and Clint, I gave you very brief introductions. Forrest, do you mind telling us a little more about yourself before we yeah. dive in? Sure. So um, uh, Forrest and I own Gumby's Pizza in San Marcos. It is um, really an independent pizza Maria um, in a college town. San Marcos is about 30 minutes south of Austin, um, and it is the home for Texas State University, which is a very large Texas college, um, and we're right off the campus. Uh, we've been there, started as a delivery-only pizzeria right next to campus, um, and kind of have evolved into a larger operation over the years. We've been open uh, going into our 15th year now, um, and have moved locations once and now have a full dining room patio um, full bar um, do a significant amount of delivery um, still to this day but it's a declining part of our business model as we've kind of established ourselves as a little bit more of a dine-in restaurant so um, pretty large staff um, it would qualify as a pretty uh, busy restaurant in terms of uh, volumes compared to some of the national chains and things like that. But um, we're a very quirky restaurant and that we kind of embrace the weird and different and try to differentiate ourselves from uh, any pizzeria that you would experience in your hometown. So kind of we try to make it the place that the college kids really can in, in, uh, make their own, do a lot of weird toppings, french fries, pickles, you name it, kind of go outside the box. So um, we have a lot of fun don't take ourselves too seriously. And uh, that's kind of what we do. Awesome. Thanks for us. Yeah. I'm really excited to like dig more into the culture you have at Gumby's and how you've built that by hiring great people. Cause you shared a lot of cool things and prep for this conversation. Uh, Clint, who are you? Let me start by saying that I think the pickle pizza was probably one of the bigger surprises of something that I've eaten. It, it was amazing. Uh, so, and my wife loves salty kind of savory stuff. So it's, it really, it's right up her alley. Hey, but I'm Clint Smith. I founded Career Plug in my apartment in 2007 and uh, went through a lot of the struggles that I, I think all small business owners go through uh, growing their businesses. And right around 2011, I kind of used that energy and, and, and pivoted from being more of like a recruitment kind of marketing agency of sorts um, to creating recruiting software. And a lot of that was just based on the experiences that I had with um, hiring people. And, and growing my team, uh, a lot of mistakes that uh, we made and lessons I had to learn the hard way. Uh, I wanted to write a book for a long time. It was almost done and COVID came and I had to go back into running uh, the business and, and making sure that we make it through and support our clients. But this is it, it's how to hire. And um, 
it's it's really meant to be a uh, just a, a an easy field guide, uh, very accessible, small little chapters um, that you go through, uh, give you some ideas on uh, how to grow and retain your team, and um, that's it. There's mountains up here, and because path has looked like getting through this is is a challenge, right? And it's an adventure, uh, and what I hope to do uh, today, and then just you know by sharing this book with you in general, is just make that uh, voyage a little bit easier for you. And uh, if you can if you can walk away with a couple of ideas, uh, and even just act on one, I think it's a great win. And Forrest is someone I've known for a while, and he's um, he's an innovative person. And uh, yeah, you could say oh, he just he runs a pizza restaurant, but but they've really transformed it, uh, and he's done a lot of creative things. Um, when it comes to recruiting and retaining his team. And the other thing that I think is really interesting that, that a lot, you know, in a lot of ways, the ultimate goal for us as uh, business owners is he's not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of, of all that HR hiring and retaining people. He's been able to empower his team um, to be able to do those things. So I, I'm really excited to talk to him about that. But that's one of the things that I think about with the machine. You, you know, you can get the machine running so you can get predictable results uh, while you're still kind of at the helm. But ultimately, you can let go of some of that and then let, let your team run the machine. So I'm really excited to talk about that with you guys today. Thanks, Clint. So let me uh, kind of off that dive into one of the sections of the book that I was really inspired by and like I think evolved into this recruiting machine topic we're talking about, which is you have something you say in the book is recruit like you sell, right? Which I think really like leads into this machine. Can you just talk about that a little bit. Like, what do you mean recruit like you sell? You know, if you think about, uh, I'd, I'd say that that all CEOs or founders or business owners, are, are they've got to be the best salespeople at their company, right? They're, they're selling themselves, they're selling their business. Um, but there's an interesting thing that occurs if you, when, when you're thinking about your customers, um, you've got a different attitude as far as how you're selling to them and the experience you want to create for them than you would sometimes for your employees uh, or prospective employees. But if you really think about it, your prospective empl employees, um, if you hire a great uh, person to run kind of the day to day, you know, uh, taking care of your clients in the dining room, for example, that person's worth way more than any individual um, customer would be. Uh, but we don't really think about that unless we take a step back and look. You could um, you could hire someone that could be worth 10, 20, 100 times more than any individual customer. Uh, but there's some things I, I think when we think about the way that um, we think about employment that get us hung up on that, right? It's like you have to get away from this idea of like, hey, I'm the one with the job, right? They should be bowing down to me and begging me to work here. Um, that might be the case at some places, but the reality is for most of our clients and for us too, is, hey, you have to sell them on it. You've got to work it. Uh, you've got to be able to present yourself in a really professional and attractive way. And then when you do get the application in, it's kind of like a sales lead. Uh, I, I talk about it in the book, like sales leads are like French fries, like they're better when they're hot, right? After you wait a little while, like a couple of days, you don't get back to someone, they're going to move on and, and go look somewhere else. So it, it's really just about a mindset shift. And there are some specific tactics you can take on uh, to, to act more like a, like, like you're selling. Uh, but but that's that's really the big concept. Forrest, does that concept kind of resonate with you and how y'all approach hiring at Gumby's? Yeah, when Clint was talking, um, I think one of the thoughts that came to mind for me is that we're we're not necessarily always hiring. So um, we're, we're looking for people that fit the culture. But I think one of the things that we often find with our store is that when you're not necessarily hiring for someone that knows how to run a cash register or knows how to toss a pizza, you're hiring for that person that fits with your culture and what you guys do. Often you're, we're, the, we find out that the people we're hiring are not leaving us when they do leave us for a dollar more at Chick-fil-A or, you know, whatever places got a new sign out down the street, they're leaving us for sales jobs with tech companies, or they're leaving us for, you know, bigger and brighter futures. And so one of the things that we try to install with it, our team is like, that's awesome. Like we want to, we want what you learn here 
to propel you forward into your career. So we're, we have to sell more than just, because it's not sexy standing behind a cash register and taking people's money and throwing pizza slices in the oven. I mean, it can be fun at times um, or, you know, in the back and you're, uh, the air conditioner is not working great on a Friday night and your elbows deep with, uh, you know, guys on each side of you making pizzas and, you know, the vent hood's not working perfectly. So you've got to be able to sell more than that. And we're selling um, people on the idea that there's more training happening here and leadership opportunities and things like that. So um, I think when you start to look at your job as more than just an hourly um, type position for your employees, then that's when you can start to bring value. And then that's when they start to find you rather, rather than you trying to chase them down and keep them, you know, chained to a cash register. Yeah. It's, it's either got to help them. It's either a career for them. Right. And they're like a career service industry type person, which there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that. That's going to be a, a good chunk of stuff, maybe a little less in the college town, or it's going to be a career launcher. And, you know, one of the great examples I think about is enterprise rent a car. Um, probably the number one um, employer of college graduate, recent college graduates of anyone in the country. And that job is not glamorous at all. I don't know if you, you know, you rented a car, you've got these, they're, they're out there wearing suits in parking garages in the heat and a lot of times or the cold. And, um, you know, they have a college degree, but what got those people to sign up is this prospect of like, hey, you're gonna be able within a couple of few years, of running a multi-million dollar operation or branch of our business. And then any company, just about every company out there is gonna to wanna to hire you for some other job, whether it's in sales or management or something else. That's what they sell. They don't sell the rental car experience. For sure. Yeah, Forrest, I'm curious, uh, cause I I agree. I think, you know, putting that, that why and like, meaning behind the work, right? And having people connect to that. Was that something that evolved over time at, at Gumby's? Um, like, did you start off being like, this is the kind of culture I'm going to have. I'm going to tie this to careers. Or was this more of like a lesson along the way? And how did you make that? No, it's been a, I mean, it's been a 15 year evolution and I would be lying if I told you, I think we're there yet. Uh, we still have a lot of room to grow. Um, but um, I think it's been something that uh, I I haven't, I'll be honest, I haven't totally read Clint's book, but I know a lot of it has to do with culture. And for us, identifying probably, there was a big shift for us probably seven years ago when we spent a lot of time working on our core values and identifying exactly what those were um, and owning that it's not necessarily what I think they are. It's what, when you have a restaurant that's been around for a little bit and it starts to create an identity involving our staff in that. And so our core values are what really happens in the store on a day-to-day -day basis. And they match that. They're not, they're very um, unique to us. So I think once we started to embrace that, that really gave us a lot of guidance and where we were going. And I forgot the second part of your question, but um, I think that that's been one of the biggest things for us is really trying to get everybody on board and with what we're trying to do. And that it's not just, a pizza place where you're making X dollars an hour. And I think another part of what we've really tried to do over the last two years is try to be focused on being an employer of choice um, rather than a, an employer of necessity, or I just need a job and they've got to sign out front. So um, really diving into hiring from within and bringing in referrals from our current employees and things like that and incentivizing that um, has been a lot of what we're trying to do. And we've also added things that are not common in our industry and we figured out ways to do that. And it's hard at times, but our full-time staff has full-time benefits um, and things like that. So um, we also realized that sometimes when we looked at how much turnover we had in previous years and what that actually cost us versus actually paying a little bit more and having you know someone stay for a significant amount of time. Like if you walked into our kitchen right now, we've got um, a 90 day calendar up with all the events that are coming up and things like that. But on that calendar is also every employee's anniversary and the amount of two, three, four, five, seven year anniversaries that are on the calendar when you, every month is a lot. Um, so I think that that once you start to realize that, Hey, when I can count on a cook, you know, showing up every Friday and not calling out because they got drunk and got put in jail, that makes a massive difference in the morale and the way you can operate a kitchen and any business for that matter. So all too often, I think we settle for can, who can fog a mirror and 
lose sight of like how long can we invest in them and keep them and what does that do for our business versus just churning and burning yeah so what does it look like for you to like practically like show off this because obviously you have a really great culture and employer brand um how are you putting that into your hiring process you mentioned you get a lot of referrals which i'd love for you to talk a little bit more about because i think a lot of people we talk to are wondering like where are the best applicants coming from like where can i find these great applicants how is that translated into hiring and attracting people for you so I think it starts with retaining people, um, which is kind of what I talked about before. Um, so the more you retain, the less you actually have to hire. Um, we're in a college town, so there's a lot of turnover just from the na nature of the fact that a lot of these kids that work for us are here for four to five years and then they're gone. Um, but um, some of the things that we've done is I'm totally out of the hiring process. I hired no one um, anymore. Um, I haven't done an interview in probably two years. Um, but what we do is we empower our frontline shift leaders and managers to do all the interviews and the interviews that they do are, um, kind of pre-filtered through a process that we use on career plug. Um, but outside of that, our entire interview process is focused on kind of culture questions and, um, getting to know the person, um, that's sitting in front of you and whether or not they have the engagement and the smile and the belief that, they're a people person because we're in hospitality, right? And so if I've got somebody that can fog a mirror, but can't actually have a conversation or think outside of like, would you like pepperoni on that? Then we've got a problem. So, and that we take that approach to um, our entire staff, front of house and back of house, because we have a very cross utilization of our front of house and back of house. So our expectations are that if uh, the cooks are in the weeds, we can cross the front in front of house can go back there and help. And if vice versa, the cooks will jump on phones and take orders and do that kind of stuff. So um, we really kind of focus on that. So, um, and then for us, there's different little things that we do through the process with career plug and the way we interview and ask questions through that, that kind of self-select the right people for us. So I think a lot of employers spend very little time actually looking at their job descriptions um, and what that says about them. Um, this new generation, they they care more about like, can you, they don't wanna know, can you pick a 25 pound bag of flour up? Like that has no purpose in your job description. Your job description should make them go, oh, these guys are different. Let me leak a look into this more. Um, so that's kind of, we've, Ours are different there. Um, and then just a couple other questions that we ask, but I don't want to get too long-winded. I'm, I'm glad you brought up your job descriptions because I um, I was looking at them and I think there's like a, I think I wrote like playfulness to a mm -hmm. lot of them that really like shows off your culture. I wrote down one line. It was like, you know, think of how impressed your friends will be when you can toss out a pizza like they have seen on TV. Um, and I just thought that was so like warm and like speaking to your culture um, in a way you don't always see on job descriptions that that makes it stand out. Um, yeah, and we do, we do like, like for our back of house, like we don't have kitchen, like the job description, if you looked and we would be in line with, you know, a kitchen job for a couple different restaurants in town, but instead of saying chef or cook or back of house, uh, we are pizza ranch dealer and it talks all about being um, someone that's making something that's highly addictive and your friends won't be able to deal without. And, you know, maybe there's a line there. We like to play with it a little bit, but just being different and totally not, you know, what they would expect from a McDonald's application or that kind of stuff brings out the kids that are creative, that can think and can have, you know, I say kids cause that's mainly what we hire, but that kind of stuff. Yeah. And you, like, I talk about that in the book for us, like you attract who you deserve, right? So right. it attracts what you put out there. If if you put out a generic job posting that is, you know, that pays on the low end of the scale, you should you should not be surprised if the kind of caliber of candidates that you get are going to be on the lower end, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not all about money. Money does matter, but like it's like, hey, if you put out something where people connect and they're like, man, I could see myself working here. Like I could see myself being friends with these people and fitting in um you will attract better people and and people that are a better fit for you and your organization 
But I think that that's like an important thing to understand. Uh, one of the things I talk about is like, hey, if your organization is all about making money, right? If you're, you know, in finance or something and just like, hey, we, you know, our number one thing is to make money and we want all of our people to make as much money as possible. Be upfront about that because that's, that's who you're trying to attract. Um, but if you're looking for creativity and fun, uh, kind of more along the lines of, of Forrest's team, then, you know, yeah, put that out there, spend some time to get a really attractive careers page and job description, job posting to go along with it. We can help you out with that at Career Plug. We have a lot of the resources there. And, and I think that really does make a huge difference, not only in the number of applicants you're going to get, but also in the, the quality and the match, the fit for them. And, and they're going to be a lot more engaged. They're going to be like, oh, I really hope that Gumby's gets back to me about an interview. Yeah, I applied to Pizza Hut and Papa John's too, but this is the one that I really want to work for. Yeah, and I think that goes um, even more to being involved in your community. And I know that's harder in some areas, like, you know, more densely populated areas, but they it's very frequent that I get the feedback from our staff that when someone comes in to apply, they came in to apply because they saw what other things were doing, like what this charity event that we were involved in or these crazy social media posts that we're doing or, you know, whatever it is. So and knowing what it matters to your employees. So, you know, for, for me, our staff is, they're younger traditionally, so they don't have kids. Um, and they're a lot, very socially conscious, but a lot of them are their pets or their life. So we do a lot of stuff with the animal shelters and things like that, because that matters to the staff that works for us. So while would that be my first charity of choice? Probably not. I think they're great. And I participate in all of that, but focusing in on what matters to the crew that's working in the store and doubling down on that has then attracted people to us. Cause like some of the questions that we asked during an interview is like, describe our co company culture. Like, tell me why you're applying here. What do you, what about Gumby's is interesting to you? Um, not like, tell me about what you did at Chick-fil-A. Like I could care less. So. Yeah. And, and that's also going to lead people uh, who work for you already to go out and tell their friends about it and attract them, which, you know, if, if they're a good fit for you, the people that hang out with are probably similar in a lot of ways, like A players hang out with other A players. Uh, can you talk about your referral program and how it's actually structured? Because I, I do think like that's one of those things as far as like recruit like you sell, it's like, you know, being able to get referrals from your current customers is the best sales source you could have, right? Going right. to the job boards only is kind of like going to Google and just, you know, putting it out there and hoping someone finds you or maybe you advertise on Google. Uh, can you talk more about like how it works? Like actually some of the nuts and bolts with it too? Yeah, it's it's super simple. And what we found is that the more complicated we make it and the more rules or it just, it doesn't get utilized. Um, and so what we've settled on is for our dollar amount, it's $150. And if you send us someone we hire them and they make it out of training that next check, you get $150 bonus. Um, there's not any strings attached to it. There's no, they have to work. We've tried things in the past where they have to work here for three months or they have to work here for six months, or that also became a logistical nightmare of tracking all that stuff. And then we ended up doing more damage to ourselves because we didn't follow through on what we said we were going to do. Um, so we've tried to make it really easy, simple, and we, we talk about it all the time, especially um, with our leadership in terms of our shift leaders and our managers in the store is like, you know, if we need somebody, like, have we, have we re-mentioned that we're paying the $150 and depending on need, it'll go higher or lower, but that's about as low as it goes. Cause right now uh, we're not uh, really hiring right now, unless somebody what would you say your return is on that 150 bucks for getting okay. a, a referred candidate. Uh, in terms of like how many we hire are from that or, or just, yeah. Like what, is it worth it to you? Uh, obviously it is cause you're doing it, but like, it's, um, it's, I, I know yeah. people that have done the math on it and it's like, this is a home run. Like this, yeah, it's like, I, I don't, I, I don't have quantitative numbers on it, but I can tell you that the people we hired through that are also our crew knows they don't want someone coming in that is a dud. So they're not going to like, we've had people come like, if, I'll give you the reverse of that. I have had in a situation where we've had a crew member come to us and say, Hey, so-and-so put my name down. I heard they, they applied, do not hire them. Cause I don't want my name associated with them. So not only have they referred us people, but they're filtering people for us too. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it has, it has 
dual benefits in that aspect. So, um, but I mean, it's massive for us. Um, I, I wish it was all of our hiring, but it's not, I would say it would probably accounts for about 20 or 30% of the hires every year. Um, but the retention is much better. Um, and then we're, we're, they already know about it. So they know from their friend that works there kind of what they're getting into. Cause I, you know, our, we'd like to have a very relaxed, fun atmosphere, but Friday, Saturday nights, Thursday nights, it gets chaotic in there. So it can, you know, I don't, there are people that'll walk out of there crying because it's a very stressful, high paced environment. So it does, we do need to make sure we're attracting the right people. Yeah. I mean, 20, 30% from referrals is still really good in, in my book. Um, so that's awesome to kind of like move us down the, the machine a little bit, the, the recruiting funnel. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit like, so once people apply and then the actual interview, and we've talked a little bit about evaluation stuff, but Clint, there's something you say in the book that I like, which is you write that many companies like think they have an applicant problem, but they really have an interview problem or an interview conversion problem. Can you kind of set that up for us? What do you mean by interview conversion problem? Yeah, it's it's and look, I've done it even like directly with um, a client where I'm like, all right, hold on, I'm gonna um, you know take a look at your account from my side too to see who you're working with, and you know. Um, it's the challenge isn't always, yeah, there are instances certainly where someone's not getting enough qualified applicants, but what I've seen um, more than anything is just, we're not the ones, the qualified applicants that are coming in aren't getting converted into interviews. Right. And the number one culprit for that is just people, you didn't get back to someone or you didn't get back to them soon enough. Right. If you get back to them a week later and you're talking about a job, that's more of like a frontline job, they're gonna they're gonna already have a job somewhere else, right? Especially if they're, yeah. You know, we work with a lot of um, companies in in some of these licensed trades like massage therapy or plumbing or things like that. And if if one of those high caliber candidates comes through, uh, and you have to take a week to get back to them, I've had people say, look, after forty eight hours, you might as well delete the resume because they're gonna be gone and off the market. If they've decided they want to leave and go get another job, people are gonna be lining up to hire them. So. It's kind of like, it, it's, I, I write down that it's, it's, it's always, it's, and I learned this from some other marketing book, that it's better to be first than to be best, right? If you're the best employer and the best choice for them out there, it doesn't matter if you don't get back to them and the opportunity is not right there. Like you've got to be in front of the line. So with that, there's ways you can do that with the machine we talked about uh, where you can automate some of these things more. There's we have options within career plug where if, if someone, especially if you're hiring for a role where you, you're looking for a licensed person or things like that, where you can get them rolling into the, into the process pretty quickly, automatically um, sending them a message, asking them to schedule an interview, things like that. It, it's really about having a process in place to be able to do that. Cause look, we're business owners. Um, a lot of us are not that organized. Uh, and we're, if we're short staff, we're particularly like hair on fire trying to figure out. So it's, it's really just about having a system. The system might even be as simple as like, hey, I'm going to block out half hour each day when I'm in hiring mode to, to review my applicants and follow up with them. Something like that. I think, um, yeah, setting up the the recruiting system. I mean, we use CareerPlug um, and setting up the automations in there has been really important to us. And then I also think, um, even it doesn't matter if you're a restaurant or a hiring for healthcare. I think making the automations um, sound like they came from you and come from your perspective is really important. The amount of, you know, so if someone checks off some of our, our immediate requirements that makes them a good match on paper for us, we send them the really quick um, math uh, and personality assessments that take like no time at all, but the email that gets sent to them comes from me and it's very personal and it's not systematic and it's very kind of almost informal. And the amount of people that not only fill that out, but also send back an email to tell me that they got it is really high. So I think making sure that you take the time to set the systems up to empower yourself and then kind of like what Clint was saying and time blocking and things like that has been really helpful for us. Um, and we use one of the things for our, our hiring process that my managers use is 
um, the text messaging, we do that almost exclusively through the system um, because uh, we found that with do not call list, people don't answer phone numbers that they don't know anymore. But if they get a text from, uh, it says, hey, this is Forrest with Gumby's Pizza. We saw you applied. We'd love to talk to you about an interview. Almost vast majority of the time they get responses really quickly. And then we monitor that as a team. So it's not one person monitoring it. So. And that's one of the benefits of using it in the system as well. It's like, you know, some people may um, just text from their phone or whatever, which has its own challenges. If someone replies to you in the middle of the night or whatever, mm -hmm. or asking you, hey, why didn't you get back to me for the, or hire me? Uh, but like if, if you do it through a career plug, you have that buffer. But then like if one shift leader leaves and another one comes in to pick it up, it's like they can pick it up where the other person left off, which is like part of that. Like, hey, I can step away from this thing and let this thing run like a machine. Totally. Yeah, I was gonna kind of ask to that that point because Forrest, you said you stepped back a couple years ago, and your team kind of do this now, which is like, I don't know, the ideal of having a recruiting machine, right? Mm -hmm. That you just like know know it's running. What did that look like for you? Like, was it difficult to make that transition? Did you set certain expectations? Like, how did you for for all the people listening who are like, I'm still really in it. I would love my managers to do this. Yeah. Um, can you them any advice? I think so. I think there's a couple of things. I think that, like Clint talked about earlier, the founder, CEO, owner of a business is most likely the best salesperson that they have. But you always reach a point where you may be the best salesperson for your pizza or your healthcare system or whatever it is. At a certain point, you can't keep doing it. You need to hire someone. So um, I had to get a little comfortable with the idea that maybe they're not going to do it as good as me, but if I can get them to 90, 85% of what I could do and I can go focus on other things that that'll make a big difference for the way we can do things moving forward. So, um, I think that, and then just systematizing everything into a process and we do it the same way every time. And my staff knows that when we meet on Wednesday morning, we go over needs and if we are needing a driver, then all the people are logging into CareerPlug to look for driver applications and start that process. And we've empowered everybody on our team. If you see someone on there, schedule an interview uh, as long as, and here's the process. So we've got, here's the interview questions you ask. Here's the form we use. Here's how we put it back into our Slack channel for hiring. Here's how you message that. So it's just building a system um, to get yourself out of it. Because uh, to be honest with you, that the vast majority of the issues that we have in the restaurant or because I won't get out of the way or one of my managers won't get out of the way at that point. So building that system around it and then trusting the process. Um, and you know, for the way I had one, the, somebody told me this and it kind of got me out of the way of my own self. And it was like, okay, so do you trust your managers to open the store, close the store, make the bank deposit, do all these other things? Um, yeah, for sure. I couldn't do it. I'm not going to close the store. I've got three kids. Okay, well, then why don't you hire, trust them to make the hiring decisions and hire their staff that they're working with? Um, I don't really know, right? So if you're trusting them with these other things, or you've got the team that you trust with something else that is just as important, then you've probably got someone on your team that can help you get this process going. And if you don't totally turn it over to them completely, because I didn't um, until, you know, trust to verify, there's a way to get that going. So, um, and even if it's just, okay, I don't have time to do all of the screening and uh, the text messages, but I still want to do the interviews. Great. I bet there's a perfectly talented person on your team that could do that for you. So finding a way to start to get yourself out of that. And that's the way we've kind of worked our way to it. So, um, and then, I mean, we, yeah, well, I'll, I'll leave it. And that stuff that's like the least important thing on your plate that you want to, you know, give to someone right. else and delegate could become one of the most important things that they do. And it for could sure. be a great up or growth opportunity for someone on your team. And we do we do a lot of hiring from within all of my management. Um, we haven't hired from the outside for anybody that runs the store in terms of management for probably north of nine years. Um, and so the ability that we have that, and this is some of the things that we do. We say, okay, we've got a task. Is there anybody that's interested in this task? Even if it's not hiring. And trying to identify people that are looking for an opportunity for growth or an opportunity to raise their hand and say, hey, I'm trustworthy or, hey, I'm really good at that. Can I try it? Um, has been one of the things that we've been able to identify who would be in that path for leadership in our store and kind of can fill in those footsteps. 
We just got a, a question and kind of off that forest, um, maybe you can go a little deeper of, you know, when you recognized you were in the way, what are some examples of how you started to step back um, and kind of follow up to that? How did you not fall back into the ways you, where you weren't as trusting? Um, so yeah, I knew I was in the way when we needed to hire people and I wasn't getting the hiring done. And then we had people quitting because we didn't have the store staffed compare appropriately. And then that led us to a position where we were hiring anybody that watched through the door that could fog a mirror to do staff things that were really important to us. So I reached a point where I just realized there's absolutely no way I can do this anymore. And I don't want to do this anymore. So um, for me, it was screwing things up royally um, to the point where we were, you know, skeleton crew and it just, it didn't work anymore. So I had to sit back and realize like, I'm not doing this right whatsoever. Uh, and if I want to get this to where I want to go, I had to break it, so to speak. And what was the second question? Uh, how did you not fall back into ways where you weren't as trusting? So maybe another way to put that is how did you let people maybe make mistakes without, you know, going back in and taking. So they did make mistakes and there's no way that they're not going to. Right. And so for me, it was when we made a bad hire and we realized that, okay, these people did not work out. They were here for three weeks and left um, and whatever it's, we do a, a meeting with my staff every Wednesday that's in management and we talk about those kind of things. Okay. So what about, that person, do you did you see in the interview that you liked? And were there any signs that when you did that interview that they might this might have been a, a happen or something that could have happened? And most of the times they'll say, yeah, they said this and it kind of you know rubbed me the wrong way, but they said all these other things that sounded great. And I said, well, let's start trusting our gut, right? And so let's get more interviews in so that we can actually say no to more people to find the better people that we were saying yes to. So um, but to me, it's managing the failure forward is probably the best way to say that. So, and if you, we screw up as owners and business owners, you know, people that are running businesses on a daily basis, but we keep going forward. So helping your crew realize that it's okay to mess up, but let's talk about why you messed up, how you messed up and we, how we can maybe avoid that next time. The same way as the reason we have a system is to try and avoid that the next time. So, um, for me, it's a lot of coaching with the leadership team is the biggest thing. Yeah, and I think they just got to have context, right? Like they, they've got to understand what what you're looking for, um, what you're trying to build as an organization. The mistake that I made when, when I think I um, let go a little too soon is that I, I didn't have a system. I didn't have the exact scorecards for people to use. And I don't think they really understood. We, we weren't even on the same page necessarily like with what's the most important thing we're looking for um, with, with these hires, what's non-negotiable. And um, you've got people have really got to, understand how you think um, so that they can act on your behalf when, when they're in those situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Back to, I think some of that foundational work you did right with core values and culture and, you know, hiring people for that. Uh, Clint, I wanted to ask you about um, something else around evaluation that I think we've kind of used a lot at career plug, where she talked about like kind of three things you evaluate for during interviews, ability, motivation, and culture fit. Yeah. Uh, do you mind uh, digging in a little deeper there? Oh, not at all. It, we we set it up, we think about those three things, right? It, so it's ability, can they do it? Motivation, will they do it and they want to do it? And then culture fit, will others on our team want to do it with them? That's the way we think about those. Um, when, when you have, uh, an entry level role, like maybe someone working at the pizzeria or something, can they do it? Um, the ability piece looks a lot more like, can they smile? Are they personable? Right. And, and there's going to be certain criteria they're looking for. The rest of it can be taught. We can teach you how to work a cash register, how to do some things in the kitchen, but you want to have that. The other two things on, uh, I think are, are, are not, people don't pay attention to them as often. The motivation thing, do, will, will they want to do this, right? Do, do you have, do you, can you tell why they want to work here? Um, and then the culture fit. Culture fit is one of those things where you can fall into a trap thinking, you know, is it, are they like us, right? Are they just like us? Are they look like us, whatever else. It, it's really not that. It, it's, it's what, is there alignment with core values? 
are they um, do they are they living these core values and can they come in and and be part of the team that way? And those are the two things that I think you are, you are non-negotiable. Do not compromise on motivation. Do not compromise on culture fit. The ability thing, if, if those other two there are strong enough and you're willing to give them a little bit of time and train them, uh, you can make up a lot of ground in the ability part. Um, yeah. Do you have any, um, I, you've also passed the torch for a lot of hiring, um, Clint, but is there any like specific questions that you ask uh, that speak to any any one of those things or things you think say a lot during interviews? Some questions hold more weight than others in my experience. I'll say this. Um, it's an interesting way to, to answer your question, but like I have questions we can ask about. We have um, four core values and I have questions that I could ask to kind of like, you know, see if they would fit in there. But I actually prefer to just listen, right? And, and listen to them talk about things. If, if the core value fit doesn't just come through in how they're talking to people, like if we're talking about work together, win together is, is one of our core values. If I can't if I can't tell just based on the stories that they're talking about, but their pre previous experiences and just how they like to approach things, that teamwork and, and there's that, that kind of selflessness that comes with that is a huge part of who they are. If I've got to like ask a question to learn more about that, that's already a, a red flag for me. I'm like, it, it didn't come through shining. It doesn't, that's not always the case. There are some times where it's good to get a little more clarification. Uh, but I would think about those things. And then, you know, like, like, like Forrest even said, hey, did they do their homework, right? Why do you think you're culture fit? Because you know what that tests for? That tests for motivation, right? If Did they actually go to study the culture and understand what you're all about and, and then see that? Because if they didn't, if they're just showing up and this is one of many jobs that they just did like a spray kind of application to, then yeah, their motivation for you in particular is not going to be that high. That reminded me of um, something that Gumby's does on their applications as far as sorting out people who may just be applying to a ton of things at once. Uh, I think it's on all your applications. You have something like for bonus points, like let us know that you actually read the entire job description on the application. Uh, Forrest, can you tell us like why you started doing that and maybe like what the results or impact of adding that to your job descriptions has been? Um I mean, it's probably one of the most, that's probably our number one differentiator on if someone will get an interview, if we're looking for interviews, that's what we go to first and almost sort by. Um, and it's the very bottom of the job description. And for us, it's more of like, we, you know, for as lax as we may appear and culture driven as we are, we're highly driven by prime costs and checklists and things like that. So while we want you to bring the culture and the personality to the job, because we're a hospitality job. We also want to know that when we assign a task that you know how to follow a task, read that and follow through. So for us, it's just showing a little bit level of detailed orientist or someone that actually is taking the time to really understand what they're applying for and not just clicking on. I mean, because we all know that with the way technology is set up now, you can send your interview and apply for a million jobs really quickly these days. So that's something that we've used to really sort through. And we will also, we've limited the number, I, I fought Clint on this for a little while, and it's, I'm a convert in terms of trying to um, really lower the barriers to entry on our application. So we, I think right now we're asking four questions when they apply, not a very, or, and if they have a resume, great. If not, we don't really care. Um, um, and then one of the questions we ask is just, why should we hire you? And you'd be amazed at some of the lack of, uh, awareness that you get in some of those. And then also some of the really thoughtful insight into who that person is in a very, in two sentences that they fill out real quick. So um, for us, those are some of the things that we do on a, that's on every application that we have. So. Yeah. We ask a question or at least we used to, I don't know if we still do it. That's along the lines of like, what makes you unique? I still right. Do. And um, you'd be amazed at the different types of answers you get on that um when sometimes they're sometimes they're just brutally honest and they're like i lost my job last week i've seen what you guys do and i need a job asap like call me now and you're like there's your motivation right so yeah. um for us um when we're at, we we have a significant amount of out of part-time workers so some of them if they don't have the motivation to show up 
we may run into problems where we're having shifts not covered because people are calling out because they really don't need the money this weekend. They made enough on Tuesday. So um, making sure that there's a motivation there for them to want to show up to work is important too. Yeah, yeah definitely. Is there any, um, kind of going back to what, what Clint said, which I thought was a great answer, Clint, like, you know, listen when people tell you who they are, right? Not kind of prying it out of them. Forrest, does that resonate with you as far as how y'all interview or is there any kind of go-to questions that, that you have that are? I, mean, I would say that's probably one of the biggest coaching things that we have to drill into people when they first do interviews for us or are starting to do hiring for us is that I want you listening twice as much as you're talking. Like you're not trying to do a lot of talking here. Um, but to that point, we've also realized um, that it's gotten better in the last year or so, but during COVID, I mean, we, we were trying to convince people to work for us too. So a lot of that is selling them on why they should apply here. Cause as much as we, you know, like Clint talked about earlier, we want to think people want to really work for us and we're the best place to work or whatever, but there's a lot of options out there right now. Um, and there are, you know, it doesn't matter the category. Um, people want to, they've got a lot of choices where they can work. So selling people on why they should be at your place is something that it shouldn't, I think one of the the traps that we fall into is we try to do that during the interview. And I think some of that needs to come through in the job descriptions and the culture and some of the stuff we talked about earlier. But that's one of the biggest things that we've had to coach around is like less talking. If you are talking, like, let's just talk about these high, these, you know, culture, core values, that kind of stuff, what makes us different and not necessarily like, here's what a day at the restaurant would look like kind of stuff. Yeah. I think, I think that it's one of those things where like, you should, you got to sell them at the beginning to, to get them hooked, right. And get them interested. And, you know, I actually am really interested in exploring this with these guys, but then the table should turn and there should be um, you're evaluating them. Right. And they need to sell you a little bit. They still have questions and, and, and you know, it, it, it's, it's a mutual thing. Uh, both sides are doing that, but like, I have seen those interviews where people are desperate and um, they're selling the candidate and it's just, it doesn't work well. You're, you're, you're tuned out from the signals you should be getting from the candidate as far as whether they're a good match or not, because you're just, you're in that desperation mode and desperation mode is like really where you make mistakes. I know you told me a story about how you hired a guy from Papa John's, right? That was a manager over there. And you're like, oh, you know, hey, I need a, I need a pizza manager. So this guy worked at Papa John's, he knows pizza. Um, but how did that work out for you? I mean, it was horrible for culture. Like we ran off, I don't know how many staff members before we realized we'd made a big mistake. So, and that was the last time we hired for, well, I take that back. That was the second to last time we hired from the outside. And the other one was a horrible mistake too. So, um, and that's a place of strength that we're at right now. And I understand that not everyone can come from that with every position, but I think if you do look at your company as a place where we're trying to offer mobility upward and do that, that's a big thing. But for us, that was uh, a bad hire. That's one thing that I've realized with staff and it doesn't matter where they are on the org chart, a bad hire can do more damage than good. So I would rather not make that hire and empower the team around them to try and find a way around that than hiring someone that can fog a mirror or you get, you know, they checked seven of the 10 boxes, but you've got these massive red flags in three. And because you need a person to uh, hire them, it, it just makes so much more sense now to wait a little bit longer and find the right person. Um, and that can be really painful in the interim, but the damage that you do to your bottom line and top line sales, retention loss of, of other employees and things like that is just massive that we've, that we've come to that conclusion for us at least. And that's, you know, you, you actually reminded me of something there that I think is a, it fits into this whole evaluation piece for us is like, if you're, if you, if you have 10 things that are like your, your must have list, mm -hmm. what's the reality that you're going to find someone that's going to be able to check the box on all 10 of those, right? You're going to be like, oh, you know, all right, it's so seven out of 10 good enough now, but what if one of those three out of 10 that, that they didn't have is one of the critical things? Yeah. And it, so like for us, we learned that lesson with our core values where we had like, I think we had six or seven core values before and we'd end up hiring people like, yeah, hey, they've got about five or six of them. Maybe there's this one I got a question, but you know, that's a pretty good percentage. We lowered it down to four and now they're all non-negotiable, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like, we, we got more clear 
on what was needed. And I could say you could do that for culture, but you should also do that for that ability side of things too. It's like, what do we really need this person to be able to do? Yeah. And for me, I think it's more, um, I mean, we've lowered our core values down to four, likewise, ironically. Um, but for us, I think it's, I'm okay with, there's some questions around this maybe, and we have a little more flexibility in terms of the hourly staff that we have, but it's more of like, is there, if there's somebody gives you a red flag, um, then that's a non-negotiable for us. So, and we've also made non-negotiables that make it, a, you know, you talked about putting guardrails and systems up for your staff. For us, a non-negotiable for us is um, they don't even, if they're late to the interview, the interview doesn't happen. So, you know, if if you're not even going to show up to the interview on time, then what are the odds that you're going to show up to the rest of your shifts or the rest of the work or care about your work? So um, that's just a non-negotiable that we put in place that is a part of the system that makes it easier for my hiring managers to do their job. So they know that if the person is supposed to be there at 10, they don't show up by 10, then the interview is just not going to happen. We don't have to worry about it. So. Yeah. So as we're, we're almost at time here, if there's any final questions, um, anyone who's watching, please put those in. Uh, one thing you, you mentioned a couple of times for us is you're, you're currently not actively hiring. It sounds like you have a, a full staff right now. Um, what do you do during times like these? Do you turn off the machine? Do you take your job post down? Do you keep an eye out for great people? Like, how do you handle this non-urgent hiring period? You know, we never turn them off. So we always have the main job applications up so that we, and I, one of my manager's jobs on a weekly basis is to go through there and look at those if we're not actively hiring. But it all, something always happens. Like I, I did get a message this morning that one of my shift leaders put in their notice, but we also have enough people that are looking for those jobs, but I, I do not turn them off um, and we're constantly looking. So the answer, my front of front house knows that someone walks in and says, Hey, are you guys hiring? The answer is always yes. Um, but FYI, we have very strict requirements and whatever. So, but no, I don't ever turn it off because we also know that we could have three job openings happening tomorrow. And if we turned it off, the lead time on getting those applications in for us would be, probably north of seven days with the way the algorithms work and LinkedIn and all that kind of stuff. So while a fresh hot French fry is better, like Clint said, if uh, a lukewarm one's there and you need to hire three people, you've got to have that in the, the queue or you're going to be up a creek without a paddle. Yeah. And I think in that case, it, it, it's different, right? Like you're keeping that French fry warm by um, by having a pipeline, right? Like you're Mm. Um, not start, you're starting from position of strength. Like my whole thing is like, you can't call that person for the first time. Um, when you're, um, when you're three months later, when it's like, Hey, I actually need to hire someone now. Right. Like yeah. you need to follow up with them and say, Hey, I'd love to talk. I don't have any right now, but I'd love to stay in touch. And yeah, it might not work out with their timing, but having a handful of those people to call when that opening comes up, puts you in a much better position than if you're starting off from scratch. For sure. So I think uh, kind of final question or like thought to, to wrap up here, if there's any like takeaway or piece of advice or lesson you learned the hard way that you wanna, you know, pass on for anyone listening around hiring, building this recruiting machine, does something come to mind? I, I mean, I think I would start with what Clint started with at the beginning. like don't just pick one thing, right? Um, you're not going to get to an awesome system without just taking one step. So whether that is, and and I would recommend that you take a hard look at your job descriptions because that's the front door to your, your hiring. And I would challenge you to probably spend some time making it a job description that if you read it, you would actually go, there's a, a soul here and there's some creativity or it matches, or maybe there's not, maybe your job is a extreme data-driven thing. But what I would say is there's ways that you can make that appeal to your ideal applicant, right? So like, whether that be you making a joke in some code that a, only a JavaScript code person would understand and make them understand a little bit more about you versus, and make that own, own it. And the more you own that process, I think the better you off you'll be. So, but I think trying to do all of this at once, you're just going to set yourself up for failure. What? Yeah, like I think most small business owners are familiar with this idea of working in the business versus working on the business. I think the application here for this machine is like, 
Are you spending all your time running the machine? Or are you spending time building it, right? You should be the one building it and optimizing it. And you need to let go of some things um, and let some other people run it so that you can create the space to be able to do that. And I think that's ultimately what's gonna get you to a, a stronger position. Agreed. Thank you both. I'm going to put some resources back up on the screen for everyone as we close out. So we're going to send a follow-up email by tomorrow with the recording, and I'll put these resources again. But if you can't wait and want to download Clint's book, How to Hire, the free ebook copy, there's a QR code there. You can also visit howtohire.com. Um, and we also have a lot of resources on career plugs blog as well. And if you want some more information about Career Plug or if you're a current client and you'd like some help with your uh, account, we do consultations as well. I'm going to put a poll up on the screen here. So if you do want a, you know, someone hiring expert to follow up with you, look at your account, see if we can help make your job descriptions better, let us know. We'll make sure we follow up. If you're not a client and just want to learn more about us, you can let us know as well. Again, we'll send you an email tomorrow. But, you know, Clint, Forrest, thank you so much. I always learn so much from these conversations. It was really cool to hear about Gumby's and congrats again on that, that award, Forrest. That's Thanks. awesome. Yeah, really appreciate it, Forrest. Uh, it was great you. Excellent. Okay. Well, I think we'll end a minute early on time, everybody. I hope everyone has a great afternoon and we'll see you next time. Thanks.